David Bohm Seminar Series 2, Saturday, December 2nd, 1989, 4 o'clock afternoon session, Oak Grove School, Ojai, California. <clears throat> Ready? All right, well, let's we'll start the um, afternoon session now. I thought, I thought we'd we'll begin by considering a few questions, maybe five, ten, ten minutes or so, then, then go on. Uh, anybody want to start? Phelps. No, I can, but I, yes. yes. Can you speak up, please? Uh, the thoughts that we have are going around all people, but some people have different perhaps different biological or genetic factors that cause, and cause them to condition themselves in different ways than others. Does that make sense? Well, what, what do you have in mind? Uh, well, some people are more violent than others. But more violent. They, they, and some people behave in ways that are different, but apparently, you know, they, they are in the same, similar environment, but they till, still tend to respond. Yes, well, every, every, yes, everybody will respond somewhat differently according to his constitution and his background and his conditioning, you know, what his memories are. See, one person may have a certain memory, which means this situation represents a danger, and another person has no such memory, and he is much calmer, right? Or else one person may be more excitable than another. There's always these differences, but the fundamental process, we, when we get to the depths, is similar. Is that clear? Everybody can understand the other person's process if he will be attentive and sensitive, right? Is that clear? If he doesn't reject it. Yeah, yeah so everybody can really understand the felts and thoughts and physical tensions, you know, it's, it's implicitly communicated when, when both in the uh, verbal language and the body language, right? Hmm? Now, but our general tendency is to make an image and project it all back to the other person and say, that's him. You know, he's always doing that. And saying, I don't have it, right? <laughs> but in fact, we each have it while it's, it's happening in everybody when it's happening in anybody. That's most evident with fear. In a large group of people, fear is very contagious, right? Mm. Or anger, you know, violence, they're all contagious, right? And the, pro the process of thought and felt and all that is communicated, you know, rather like a virus, which also is the communication of information to make something happen in your body. Hmm? have a tendency to catch the virus more easily. Oh than yeah, others. that's true. That's true <laughs> physically as well, right? Uh, so some people provide better nutrient environment for the virus than others, right? <laughs> that's the difference, you see. But then if their immune system can be built up, then they'll, <laughs> they'll be less favorable uh, medium, right? <laughs> Is there not a genetic inheritance contributing toward the violence at all? Well, there may be a minor factor, which it's hard to trace it, whether what inheritance would favor violence and what would not, you see. The basic factor is common to all, which is this thought process, which so easily falls into violence by, you might say there's some tendency to respond with force rather than holding, rather than suspending. See, let me put this. Perhaps, you know, everybody has it, right? Uh, it begins physically with the, responding with a bit of excess force, right? If something's in your way, you give it too much of a push, right? Hmm? <laughs> you may break it. Hmm? Uh, so that tendency can be either built up or brought down, huh? according to the whole 
experience and culture and everything. <laughs> you see, so uh, you see. Let, uh, see, we, we, I, I wanted to mention one thing that with violence or with anger or so on, or with all those things, with fear too, there can be what I call suspension. You see, if we suspend f uh, anger, then see, anger has certain thoughts and assumptions that keep it going. We discussed that this morning, right? Now, if you, ca if you accept those assumptions, you will go on being angry, right? Hmm? And one, way, one thing you could do is to say, I shouldn't be angry. I, I'm not angry, really. <laughs> <laughs> and you lose awareness of being angry while you remain angry, right? You're still violent. Huh? Uh, so that's suppressing awareness. So either suppressing the awareness of anger, or suppressing manifestations, or carrying them out is not called for. But rather suspend them in the middle in a sort of an unstable point, a knife edge, so that you can look at the whole process. You see, that's what's called for, right? Now, you see, the human race hasn't learned a lot of suspension. I think it's natural, but people, we haven't, civilization hasn't developed in such a way as to favor suspension very much, right? It tends to favor some, out, either some immediate, very often you're in a situation where you think at least that violence is going to pay, right? <laughs> a violent reaction, or, or else you say, civilization says you oughtn't to be violent, and you say, I'm not, not violent. <laughs> so you don't get anywhere. <laughs> And therefore, violence constantly grows. It goes into the program. See, the more you're violent, the more you leave a program for violence, right? And then it becomes more and more automatic. Huh? So I think that's the major factor. Well, the hereditary factor, genetic factor, is what it works on, but it, it could go either way. There is some hereditary factor, which is that we may have some tendency to respond with force where we, sh where we should suspend. <laughs> But you see, even in the jungle, force is not really called for all the time automatically. You see, in fact, most, mostly it's called for suspension, <laughs> force only very occasionally. <laughs> so to survive, you really would have to learn suspension there. Right? Now, it's in society where people lose track of that, <laughs> you know, where they inflame each other with violent words and so on. You know, you see, if they're going to have a war, the tribe has a long dance first where they work themselves up. You see, they couldn't get around to killing people in cold blood, so <laughs> they've got to work themselves up and, uh, with a big dance and uh, also all sorts of shouts and phrases saying, you know, how brave they are and how noble they are and how bad the other side is and whatever. I don't know what they say, but <laughs> and then eventually they get into a state where they can do it, right? Uh, I mean, but uh, I was told apparently that a lot of, say, among the North American Indians, a lot of the raids and so on were largely for the sake of demonstrating your bravery and your good, you know, <laughs> showing what a great person you are. <laughs> Not so much of, out of, and it didn't really come out of violent feelings so much, right? <laughs> Although violence was developed as they did it, but <laughs> uh, so. Uh, uh, the kind of violence, you see, but as civilization develops, it gets to be more serious, you see, this <laughs> I mean, the stakes get higher and so on. You're sort of always whipped into a state of pre-frenzy now, and just advertising is always trying to make everything, the whole system is sort of designed to keep us keyed up. Yes, in fact, it's the same. The system is designed, it can only work by growing. It can also only work by keeping us keyed up, right? See, if we stop being keyed up, the economy might collapse, right? <laughs> We'd all suffer. Right? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> this whole... We keep seeing that we keep talking about everything being organized around thought, that feelings, responses, emotions is all organized around thought. That thought seems to be the center of it. Is that that way because of what we become, or would you try to say that that was a natural state? Well, if you see what I mean by the word thought, I mean the response, the overall response of memory. You see, the program. You see now, experience of memory has certain intellectual conclusions in thought, 
One of them is necessity, do you see? Thought affects us very much, you see. Now, one of the power, most powerful effects of thought is the thought of necessity. It means literally it's got to be that way, it can't be otherwise, right? But the root of the word necessi in Latin means don't yield, you see. So intellectually it says it's got to be that way, it can't be otherwise. And emotionally and physically it says hold, don't yield, right? <laughs> the two go together. Right? See, the notion of necessity is not merely an intellectual notion. It's the most powerful, one of the most powerful things there are because through necessity you will overcome all the instincts, right? It will drive you against the instinct, the instinct for survival, for example. Hmm. You see, uh, during the First World War, there was one Christmas where all the soldiers on the two sides decided to fraternize and get together and have a celebration. <laughs> and they enjoyed themselves, and the next day they went back to war, you see. <laughs> so why did they do it? Right? They said, it's necessary. I mean, <laughs> we've we got to do it, right? <laughs> uh, it was thought that drove them back, right? See, the thought they've got to go back was much more powerful not only than their instincts, but their immediate feelings, which were true feelings, said we, there's no reason for us to be fighting here. <laughs> we really are good friends. <laughs> we're all the same, right? <laughs> we shouldn't be fighting at all, right? That was their instinct told them that, and their, their true feelings told them that, but thought said you've got to do it, right? When you have a feeling in your body or like in your stomach or uh, a feeling that comes from memory, you call that thought too? Yes, I want to put it all, because I think there's no real distinction. You see, everything that goes into the memory goes in the same hopper, you see. <laughs> they, they're, they're associated, right? Hmm? You have a tight stomach in a, in a tense situation is a kind of thought. That's thought, you see, because that, you remind, it's on the program, in the memory, that that sort of situation is bad. And in that situation, you got tense in the past. See, the reaction is to produce certain thoughts, certain sense of necessity, certain perceptions, right? Certain felts. It all comes out together. It jumps up together, right? right. As a package, right? We have a tendency to think of thought as just the mental part. Well, that's right. That's part of the mistake of our, civilized, of our culture, right? So an ulcer is a kind of thought. Yes, it's, the, it's part of the thought pattern, yes. Uh, uh, you see... You say, I can't stomach that person. You see, you say it, right? <laughs> you say, you, know, you say, whenever I get into that situation, I'm downhearted, you see. Uh, I take it to a heart and I'm downhearted and uh, my spirits droop, you see. Uh, now, the word spirit has the same root as uh, breath, right, and wind, right? And you see, you say, my spirits droop and your breath stops, you see, and... You, you, you're not breathing properly anymore. It's part of the expression of the whole thing, right? In the memory, it's all tied together. So when that happens, the stomach gets constricted. The heart is no longer working right. The breath isn't right. Now, see, that is not just a metaphor, right? Some people would say, well, it's a metaphor comparing spirit to wind or breath, right? But I wanted to say in the more primitive times, there was what we call participatory thought that I want to discuss. The people felt that the whole, everything was participating. You see, like this, the spirit was all one, right? In fact, uh, there, there was a film I saw once on television, uh, Eskimos, and uh, they were hunting the seal. Well, the, the, what they, their whole culture said, and the, there's only one seal, <laughs> the spirit of the seal, right? It manifests everywhere, and they pray that it should manifest to them so they won't starve, right? <laughs> you see, so uh, the point is that they say, that's all one seal. Now, how could you say such a silly thing? You think, nowadays we say, right? It's obviously so many different seals. <laughs> uh, but it's a different way of thought, right? Uh, to them it looked that way, and to us it looks this way. Hmm? So uh, the, the point is, I can sort of illustrate it to you. Suppose I'm talking, see, we're talking together. I see you and I hear you, right? Very different experiences. But the person that I see is the person that I hear, right? Is that clear? They're one and the same. That's a way of thought which puts them together, right? Hmm? Now, you could say that the, the, the breath that is going on in me is the spirit which is the great spirit or the universal spirit, right? It's a very similar way of thought. Do you see it? <clears throat> uh, so that <clears throat> the heart was participating, the heart, the lungs, the stomach were participating in the whole thing, right? 
You see, it's a different way, and that's the way for a million years we were, right? And in the last 5,000 years, we turned it around, and our present language says that's all nonsense. We won't pay any attention to that at all. And then when the symptoms come, we say they're psychosomatic, you see. But you see, that says that the psyche has somehow affected the soma. But I think that's not clear, you see, that the psyche and the soma were never separate. <laughs> hmm? And in fact, it's going on in us all the time. That, that way of, of uh, thought survives in us, and yet our language doesn't acknowledge it, right? Therefore, we meet it as something not thought, right? We say that is a stomach symptom. <laughs> That's an ulcer, right? But we have fragmented this thought off from the rest of our yeah. organism. Yeah. We have said the thought is just the intellect, right? At, mo at most, we'll bring in the emotions. But then it's much harder to say it's also the stomach and the heart and the lungs and the, and the solar plexus and everything. The neck, people say, oh, you give me a pain in the neck, right? <laughs> now, that's part of that basic way of thought, right? The expression of a sensation is... It's the, memory, it's the response of memory which has meaning, right? In any form. In any form. So, and they're all connected because they associate all, all sorts of thoughts associated. Once, they're, once they get thrown into this uh, disk, as it were, they're all associated and they all tend to spring up together, especially if there are associations established, right? So you like, I've had a cut on my arm that I must have cut a nerve years ago, and every once in a while it twitches. Yeah. Is that a kind of thought? Well, it's a memory of it. It's a kind of very crude memory, yeah. But, yeah, it is a very crude memory, but uh, uh, generally I would connect it to the memories which are all tied up together the way I suggested, right? Right. I'm just trying to get the feeling. Yeah, but when you I see, some set in the body is part of the memory. As a result of having... Uh, thought in a certain way for a long time, the body took a certain attitude and stance. It became fixed there too, right? Now, that meant that that was expressing, or that was participating. The body was participating in the thought. But then that stance also part uh, help, uh, uh, affects the mental process, right? When I hear you say thought, I usually think there's thought and then everything related to it. But what you're saying is it's not that way at all. It's that the name for all of these relationships is thought. You've got to give it one name, or else you, if you give it many names, you're going to break it up, right? We've got to give it one name. I suggest the best name to give it is thought. The thought includes the unconscious. And unconscious, too, the implicit, the unconscious. Uh, uh, most of that is unconscious. See, we're not conscious of how the heart and the stomach and the lungs and all that are uh, part of our thought, right? We could become conscious of it, but we're generally not, right? In fact, our whole society has developed in such ways to make us unconscious of it, right? By, the language says that none of that is happening at all. If it does happen, it's a physical problem. Do you have another name for what we call this one portion of this big thought? The intellect. You'd like to call that the intellect? Yes. What we usually call thinking? Yeah. Thought? Yeah, the intellect. You see, there's the intelligence, which is something more general. And the intellect is the past participle, you see. And therefore, it's what has been remembered, what has gone on the program. Uh, right? The intellect is that active mental part of this big thought. Yeah. And the emotions are another part, the feelings, the body is another part, right? And then, and so on, right? Now, I think that you'll find that way of using language helps you to look more clearly, right? Because once you set up a word, then your attention tends to go according to the way you set up the word, right? That's what, if thought means to me the intellect, I'll be looking at the intellect, right? Now, suppose I say, I don't want to use the word thought for all that. So I say, I have various words, thought, feeling, body, and so on. But then I say, let's look at it all. It's rather clumsy to say, look at thought, feeling, body, <laughs> right? See, so I say, let thought mean all that because... Uh, <laughs> It means uh, uh, it's all inseparable, you see. It's like saying, you see, the, the person I hear is the person I see and the person I touch. It's all one. <laughs> now, all of that is one, you see, one process, which is man manifested or experienced or you know, sensed in different ways, right? Like saying the seal that we sense is always the same seal, though we sense it in different places. You see, that, that may not be, to us, that may seem not true at all, but still, it's worthwhile to appreciate 
that thought. You see, this is part of the spirit of dialogue. We want to appreciate the meaning of these other cultures, whether we agree with it or not. <laughs> Rather than saying, oh, that's all nonsense, Our, ours is right. <laughs> of participatory thought that we use? Yes, I think so. I'm going to discuss that now, you see, uh, uh, in a few minutes anyway. And you see, the, uh, <clears throat> so, uh, the, you see, there are several kinds of thought. We have what we call literal thought, right? Now, that's the kind we favor nowadays, right? That aims at being a reflection of reality as it is, right? Or a representation. Hmm. It, tells, it just tells you the way things are. That's what it says, right? And we say that's the best kind of thought. Right? Now, then we have poetic thought, which used to be more highly valued, which was metaphor and so on. That, not literal at all, right? But it has some sort of value. Now, then uh, we have what we call hortatory thought, which is, it tells you what to do, right? That's very participatory. It says, cheer up, you know, <laughs> be good, <laughs> right? Hortatory, exhort. It has the word exhort, right? Right. That's clearly, that's very, clearly very participatory because it's aimed at doing something, right? Hmm. Uh, but uh, you see uh, now, but that's a very limited kind of participatory thought, right? See, the notion of participatory thought goes very much further than that. Right? In fact, uh, you see, in, in these very early times, there was a great deal of participatory thought. Well, perhaps they knew, they probably knew about literal thought, but they used it in a few cases, you know, practical cases. That's a guess of mine. But uh, at the same time, the things that really mattered to them were mostly participatory thought, right? <clears throat> and the, uh, uh, you see, they say the totem, the, the tribe and the totem, we're identical, right? Now, you say, how can you say we're identical to that thing over there? You say that it makes no sense to us, right? But they're saying that the two, there's mutual participation. We participate together in something common, right? So just as I say that tri the, the, the person I hear is the person I speak, so I say the totem is the tribe, right? You contact the tribe through the totem or through the person, right? Through the people. Hmm. Uh, you see, now we say it's very interesting to try to think that way. Put yourself in that place, right? I suggest that we are always doing it anyway, but we, it's part that has never gone, right? <laughs> You see, when we say, I am my country, you see, when my country is attacked, I am attacked, we're doing exactly that, right? Hmm. When you cross our boundary, you have hit me, right? Well, I say, that's nonsense. The boundary is way over there, and here I'm right here. You see, well, how, how can you say that? <laughs> uh, so, but anyway, we're, we're ready to lay our lives on the line for that, right? So the, uh, uh, then... I mean, we... we... We explain it by saying that gives us a sense of security. Belonging. Yeah, but we could explain the tribal uh, per, the same way. You see, saying, okay, it's nice to be all together with this totem. You see, and in fact, we're all together in the great spirit, right? The great spirit manifests in everything, right? And that gives us a wonderful sense of security, too, perhaps even better. <laughs> so uh, the, uh, uh, now, uh, so we do a great deal of that but we claim we're not doing it. You see, literal thought claims we're not doing that at all, right? <laughs> see, it's, it's very incoherent. <laughs> see, we have given very high value to literal thought. Well, we actually are giving the most supreme value to participatory thought anyway. <laughs> uh, uh, now, <clears throat> uh, it's all very muddled. Then we try to explain it by saying, our, my country is really there, and so on. It's literal, right? And you try to find it, and it's not there, you see. now. <laughs> The, uh, the unity that you talk about is not there, you see. Now, the, uh, so, uh, uh, now, uh, this participatory thought then went into the shade. It got eclipsed in some way, but it remained in some underground. And literal thought took over and made possible technology. In many ways, it was a tremendous advantage to, to go to do that. See, participatory thought had a lot of good points. Everybody shared. Participation means sharing. It means partaking of, like sharing food and taking part in. In other words, we all partook of the whole great spirit, but, or, or everything in the tribe, but also taking part in maintaining it. <laughs> and, uh, and that sounds very good, and in some many ways it was very good, but it had some negative features too. And For example, people went wrong. You see, cannibalism is a form of participation by saying, by eating you, I t partake of your virtues, right? <laughs> Uh, so it could go wrong. <laughs> uh, 
at least we don't approve of it today. <laughs> and the uh, <coughs> uh, now uh, the uh, uh, and also magic is a form of participation because we say uh, when I my thought and that thing are participating together, right? So they're the, uh, basically one. Huh? So by thinking, I can change that, or that can change me, right? And that may have, some people still believe that magic will actually work, but whether it does or not, you could then say, even if you believe magic works, you've got white magic, gray magic, black magic. In other words, you can do some very bad things through black magic. And the, uh, uh, so this notion of participatory thought is not necessarily a formula for perfect happiness, you see. <laughs> now, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, also, we now feel that many of those notions of participation were fanciful, at least to us, right? Like magic. Now, some people say, nevertheless, it's real, right? <laughs> uh, but at least by removing that notion of participation and making everything literal and separate and so on, we were able to develop modern science and technology, right? Which obviously had a lot of advantages <laughs> and dangers as well. <laughs> now, the... Uh, uh, but... The difficulty is that we never really got free of participatory thought. It's still there under, underground. And the literal thought is causing trouble because the literal thought is claiming just to tell you the way things are and claiming it is not participating. You see, now that is where the trouble is. The major source of our trouble is literal thought, <laughs> which claims not to be doing anything when it is. You see, all thought is participatory. <laughs> Because every thought affects the way you see things and feel things and, you know, and so on. Right? It affects consciousness. We discussed that this morning, like saying that the, that the fellow who was blind from birth didn't see very much. He had to do a lot of thinking to, before he could see anything. Hmm? Uh, now, every thought affects consciousness, right? And therefore affects what's going to happen. Because the whole system, see, consciousness could be compared to a kind of show, actor show, and the whole system is taking cues from that show as to what to do, right? Hmm? And therefore, literal thought affects that and says it doesn't do it, right? It says, I do nothing. I only tell you the way things really are. Now, that is basically why the kind of error I've been talking about all the time, saying thought does things and claims it's not doing it. An example like religion, where the participation in the religion... It's a whole belief system which is participatory, but it says it's using a literal idea that there is a God. Or, yeah. And those are the two things. Well, religion generally combines particip uh, openly participatory elements and some elements that are supposed to be just informative, but are also participatory, right? Like you just said, right? But there also are rituals. It has rituals and all sorts of things like that, which are openly participatory. You're taking part and partaking of God, uh, of, of that uh, whatever the spirit is supposed to be, right? I was just wondering if people really are grasping the difference between this literal and this participatory. Well, let, see, let's say take science would aim to try to tell you literally the way things are. <laughs> now, in fact, it, it, the very progress of science shows it, it can't be done, you see, because of the quantum theory, which says there's an in, indivisible connection between, say, any one part of the universe and another, finally, in a very accurate treatment. And when you try to make a measurement, therefore, an observation, you make a fundamental, uh, you participate in the thing that you're trying to measure, so you're not measuring, right? Well, we have a society that claims to be highly literal, there practically is no such thing. Un ultimately, there isn't, but there is in a certain relative sense, right? In a rather small sense. Well, to us, it may seem small when we look at it in this broad, but it looks very big in society because everything that's going on in society has come from that, right? Most of it. Laws are kind of literal. Kind yeah, of but in fact, they're very participatory, right? The point that you made regarding what science has moved to in quantum, wouldn't that then necessitate your saying that... But, Thought is participatory. I mean, yeah, well, that, that, it does, I think, but I mean, but you don't even need to refer to science to see that. I mean, I understand that. <laughs> I mean, if you, if a scientist were in fact to lay that out to you, yeah, could you then not? Well, somebody that? might object, saying this is just a temporary situation in science today. Maybe tomorrow you'll discover something else, right? <laughs>
so you can't count on it, but you say at least as far as we know from science, it's, it's participatory. Uh, <clears throat> is, it, is it wrong to say that um, literal thought is, a pa it seems objective, yeah, and it isn't, and and it actually is subjective, which is what was participatory. Yes, it has, it has a, it may be relatively objective in some sense that this table is here, you see, but in this large object, uh, the effect of thought is very tiny, right? Yeah. But in the atom, it's very big, right? Or in the mind, it may be very big, or in society, it's very big, right? Or in the ecology, it has become very big, right? You see, in the long run, thought has a very big effect. You see. Uh, uh, if you try to make a pro, you know, make a poll of people or a probe, you know, to questionnaire, the way you put the question determines not only the answer but also it may affect the way people behave. Right? Hmm. That's rather similar to quantum mechanics. <laughs> uh, so we have to say that. Thought is participatory, that everything participates in everything. That's the lesson of modern physics. And that thought in particular is especially participatory <laughs> because very tiny thoughts can have tremendous consequences. You mean that, and I don't mean a pun on words here, when you say everything participates in everything else, you're meaning that literally, yeah. not metaphorically. Yes, I'm not, uh, I'm not against literal thought. It's relatively, it's as literal as I can get. You see that we, that we again are going to have that thing that if we try to be absolute and say this or that, we're going to get into this paradox, you see. But we have to move between literal thought and metaphorical thought or participatory thought. We can't stay in one or the other. We're always somewhere in between, right? We may be more of one or less of the other. You see, we can't get along with nothing without literal thought, without the concept of literal thought, right? But we don't take it literally. <laughs> to, uh, we don't take it absolutely literally. I don't know how. There's always a paradox in attempting to say it, right? <laughs> so the only difficulty would be if we took literal thought literally. Yeah. Or if we took participatory thought too literally, it would be also wrong. You see, <laughs> because literal thought is needed too, right? You see, we can't even say this thing without some literal thought, right? <laughs> but then that literal thought is participating by saying this, Things have changed, <laughs> right? If people will take this into account and take it seriously, things would change very radically. <laughs> so the mere statement that from literal thought changes things. You see that all literal thought is participatory. And, uh, part and in other words, what we have to say is there's a particular kind of participatory thought called literal thought. <laughs> well, we have mistakenly said there are two kinds of thought. <laughs> That's fragmentation, right? You see, literal thought is a particular kind of participatory thought that tries to reflect uh, things. It tries to be in correspondence with reality, right? Make a sort of a picture, a representation. Hmm? Technological things, it isn't, it isn't so out of, out of whack, out of kilter, but when it comes to psychological things, yeah. then it's like if you participate in your society and then literally kill someone, well, then you've made a big mistake there in those processes. Yeah, well, society is highly participatory to thought there, right? Because it exists only through thought, right? Yes, yeah, sharing of thought. Consciousness is a kind of participatory. Yeah. It's all participatory because whatever thought is in consciousness, the whole system, the body, the nervous system participates, right? If you literally feel something strongly about this participatory, you're liable to be out on a limb psychologically. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, when I think that people have really strong held beliefs to the point where, like what's going on in the Middle East, they're killing each other yeah. over something that they've just been participate, you know, the consciousness of the group is and participatory, but literally they're shooting each other. Yeah, and also, but they believe in the literal truth of, of their thoughts, right? That's a participatory. It, but it's very, part, the more, the stronger they believe it to be literal, the more it's participatory. Right. <laughs> so it's a, it's a suggesting that literal thought may be necessary up to a point, but we, we cannot take it seriously or believe in it. Um, yeah. 100%. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and, and it's really a kind of participatory thought, with, and no matter what happens. But it, a certain kind of thought may be relatively non-participatory in certain areas and also provide a, a reflection of reality or correspondence with reality, you see. Back one space and, and, and uh, use that Arab-Israeli uh, metaphor to describe what is participatory and what is literal in the conflict that has existed. Yes, well, you see, uh, the... Uh, Arabs and Jews have certain ideas about each other which they think are literally true, right? I mean, one of them being, each one says of the other that they only understand force, right? Hmm? Force, which justifies violence, right? <laughs> so uh, they believe that each one forms an image of the other, and they believe that that is just the way the other is. This image is only telling them the way the Arabs or the Jews are, right? Hmm? But in fact, it's producing the whole situation, right? Participating in a big, long, gigantic image that a whole group of people. Can yes, and the two images call each other up. You see, uh, that uh, see, the two kinds of nationalism sustain each other, right? You see, they're never. If you go back to the First World War, before there was no Arab nation, there was only a lot of different kinds of people speaking Ar different kinds of Arabic <laughs> who could hardly understand each other anyway, <laughs> and the um, uh, now. Uh, I think the British invented Arab nationalism. It was Lawrence of Arabia, <laughs> and, uh, and then it, it took it took hold. You see, and caught on, and uh, the uh, and then there was Zionism, which uh, was Jewish nationalism. And when they started settling there, then uh, it created some conflict. And the Arabs said, well, you know, they tried to get to re respond with Arab nationalism, right? But the more Arab nationalism there was, the more Jewish nationalism it called for, and vice versa. <laughs> so they built each other up. Hmm. See, by thought, right? But it was very participatory. It created the very thing which they were thinking about, right? That's true of every nation. Every nation was created by participatory thought. So we think the nation is literal. Yeah, we think the nation is literally there, independent of thought, right? Yes. And in fact, that's the, the survival of that primitive participatory thought in which we identify ourselves with the nation. You see, as you say, all the seals are one, so all the people in this nation are one. That's the same thought, right? If one is attacked, all are attacked. That would end with it with the end of nations, or would it well, then they wouldn't be taken that seriously. They might be convenient units, or they might have some com culture in common, or you know, there could be various ways in which you would continue something like that. But it wouldn't be given that supreme importance. Now you see that that alone would release a lot of money. You see, <laughs> say a thousand billion dollars a year for armaments alone. <laughs> <laughs> ecological problem too and have a, a kind of a forcing in that direction you know that it runs counter to all this nationalism that we've dealt with mm -hmm. and uh, unless we overcome that that literal sense of nationalism you know we'll go into these ecological disasters yes uh, well I, that's true I mean that's one of the most important points you see that we have the danger of ecological disaster, which is real. It's only a question of when. I mean, some experts say 50 years, some say 100 years. You know, nobody doubts that if we keep on producing carbon dioxide at this rate, we're going to have a disaster. So it's only a question of when you think it's coming, you see. Now, see, there was a, in one article I was reading uh, in The New Yorker, you know, President Bush was trying to say this is an opinion which scientists have that they don't agree about, but they wouldn't say so. They said everybody agrees that it's going to be a disaster. It's only, the only difference of opinion is when, right? You see, now, <laughs> but uh, see, it shows the nature of thought trying to deceive itself by saying this is not serious, it's only an opinion, right? We don't want to disturb things too much, right? You see, so uh, the, uh, uh, and uh, so that, that uh, you've got to get together to deal with that disaster you know, before it comes, right? Uh, 
and uh, the uh, by the time it comes, it'll be too late. You see, uh, anyway, uh, the nations will divide to get whatever resources are left. I mean, when the disaster comes, it will not bring people together. It will drive them apart. <laughs> Uh, now, uh, the uh, uh, well, that's only one thing, but I mean, there are countless things which call, there's trade, just simply the economy is so interdependent, and it calls for ending that, this sort of uh, fiction that we're all independent, right? Uh, well, uh, there is some move in that direction, clearly, but it's very slow, you see, compared with what's needed. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> what, is it about, what is it about anything of what you're saying so far that doesn't make it just intellectual? Well, what do you mean by that? You did define or we did define intellectual before as part of the program, part of... Yeah. Okay. And yet, I could I could hear people saying, "Well, you're being intellectual about it," which would yeah, be yeah. Well, we have to be careful not to uh, uh, eliminate the intellect either. You see, the the intellect is needed. If we if we gave up the intellect, the whole thing would collapse, right? So you can't say never be intellectual, right? Because then what would you do? <laughs> uh, so uh, another person would say never be emotional. That would be stupid too, right? See, the, the human race tends to divide into two groups. One says we're intellectual, and the other, we, 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 one says we don't trust the emotions, we trust the intellect. The other says we don't trust the intellect, we trust the emotions. But it doesn't work either way, right? Now, it, you won't get out of that by saying don't be intellectual or don't be emotional, right? You see, now we do have to make a clear intellectual analysis of the situation that provides a map. And then we have to go from the map to whatever the reality is. Hmm? Now that's very subtle, that reality. And we discussed it this morning, saying it's that subtle, uh, concrete process of the mind. Huh? Hmm? In some sense, I, this might be what you suggested, is that in making our clear intellectual map, um, it's very possible <coughs> that we get sucked into the movement. Oh, yeah. And uh, we must watch I, that, yes. I, I know you're fully aware of this, and yet, uh, as soon as this thing moves here in this familiar way, I'm into a certain mode, and somehow or other, it seems I have to pop out of that before yeah. this can bear any fruit. Yes, yeah. yeah, so on the other hand, see, if we said, let's have an emotional response and uh, all have love, you would be sucked into the same thing, right? Yeah, no, no. You see, so, so we need to get beyond that division. You see, without emotion, you won't do it. Without uh, intellect, you won't do it. But something beyond is needed. Would I, have some, uh, would I have something to do with it as soon as we sit down here and start talking? We think we understand what is going on and we are in a certain mode. And that in some sense, that certainty of what is taking place here has to shift in order for us to be available to the intelligence, which is an intellect. Yes, well, can we question, <coughs> say, what, what are we doing? We've made a map, you see. Now, we, we haven't grasped the whole thing, right? right? We haven't grasped the actual concrete process that the map is about, right? Hmm? So that means we have to suspend a bit, or, you know, suspend something, right? And that, that certainty. Yeah. <clears throat> you see, <clears throat> let's just say we haven't grasped the concrete process in its actuality, but we have a map, you see, which seems to make sense. Now, uh, we need this map, you see, to, uh, because the intellect has got to take part in this whole thing. Uh, we need to have the emotional, be moved emotionally to have the energy to do anything, right? For anything to happen. Hmm. Is it the certainty that needs to be suspended? Well, something. Right? What would you say? Well, it seems that when we come together, even people who have heard what you're saying, uh, there's this division. It feels like the division of nations. It, you know, it's a very a sense that we already know what it is, but each of us seems to have a different sense of knowing, a different sense of certainty. 
Yes. But there must be something we don't know. Or you, you don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, there are two I'm questions. Asking. There are the difference of our senses, which we'll have to resolve, I suggest, through dialogue. And in that, or even without that, we have also to realize that we have not grasped the actuality very well. Mm -hmm. That there's another step somewhere missing, right? from intelligence, when in fact I think I'm hearing that intelligence must incorporate intellect, Yes. without it you, you, can't, you, can't, you can't see. Yes, yeah, so you can't talk, you can't get together. Okay. There are references here to actuality and reality. Yeah, I was a little loose in using language. Huh? Uh, well, I, I'm not sure. I, I want to explore that a little bit if I may. Uh, and literal thought, my understanding is that that assumes that there is some objective reality independent of the thinker, or yeah. the observer. And that this is a useful kind of thought in most science, at least until you get down to quantum physics, mm -hmm. uh, you measure things. And the assumption is that everyone who measures that same thing will get the same measurement, the same results. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not so useful when you get away from the hard sciences and talk about social sciences and history, because when somebody observes what's going on in history, the, the very act of observing mm -hmm. some kind of influences or changes. I mean, there is this, there's hard to get hold of an objective reality out there. And, uh, and, and is this, and, and this may, yeah. is this may, perhaps as an example of participatory. Yes, yeah, so it's, the, the society is not an objective reality, period, right? It's, it's, it's a reality created by all the people in their consciousness, right? It has some objective features that you could point to once they do it, because there's so many taking part, it's statistical, right? The same thing happens in physics, that if you try to measure one atom exactly, uh, you can't do it, it participates. If you take a whole statistical array of atoms, you can get an average that's subjective, right? Hmm? The average is objective? The average, yeah, it comes out the same no matter who does it and so on, you see, and when it, the average comes out, but the individual does not, right? Now, uh, see, in society, you can get average behaviors, which uh, are often predictable, right? But they're not very significant compared with the thing that really moves us, right? And makes the thing happen. <clears throat> and you see, uh, now, individually and collectively together, we have a, a consciousness which creates this society and sustains it with thought, intellect, feeling, and so on. perception and then writing of history itself creates history. It, it generates new ways of thinking that form how we act. And so and yeah. in that way, it's extremely participative. Yes, it affects how history develops, right? And if you go beyond history to say something like religion, it gets even, it becomes even more so. I mean, mm. the farther you get away from the hard science... Uh, yes, you see, thought is highly participatory in those areas, and... Uh, 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 and therefore, this division of subject and object is no longer a key point, right? Now, that's what we'll have to come to. You see, when we aren't to understand the self, that's based on the division of subject and object. But we're getting into an area where that division is not, is not very coherent. Most literal science is highly participatory because the, the society decides what to measure and how to measure it and what's valuable and what to pursue. and. I mean, so the whole thing is already swimming in this sea of participatory consciousness. Yes, it's highly participatory. Yeah, some, you want to back? Yeah, I was going to say that bias is so much on the side of objectivity, <clears throat> so much on the hard science that it gets transferred over into, say, something like journalism, where you have this myth of objective journalism, which doesn't in fact exist at all. Yeah, you see, we, I tend to identify objectivity with truth. I want to say they're not really the same. We'll have to come to that, really, what is meant by truth later. Uh, now, objectivity is a limited concept, you see. And uh, it has its place, but uh, some of the most important things to us cannot be handled that way. Yes, evening news is supposedly re reporting objective reality, and and in fact, in point of fact, it's it's 
selectively eliminating most of reality. But well, there's no way out of it. You see, whenever you report, you must select. You can't report everything. You see, everything is the whole concrete reality. That, that's just what you can't handle, right? Every thought is an abstraction. Whatever you do is an abstraction, right? You point your camera here and not there. That's an abstraction. It takes this and not that, right? And th therefore, you may hope that you've made an intelligent selection which is of what is relevant, you see, but uh, the... Uh, uh, but uh, uh, to some extent it may correspond in some way to some kind of reality, but when it comes to the social meaning of that reality, uh, the, you know, that's very subjective, right? You see, you're not really interested just in the fact that this incident happened and that incident happened, but what does it all mean, right? That's what... That's just what the media doesn't want to get involved in, in some <laughs> sense, you know. It's like, just wants to report show the event and not get into the... Yeah, yeah, but it always has a meaning implicitly. They're affecting things, right? They're communicating a meaning and affecting things. That's the only thing they do select are what they know people are already in with. Yes, well, they want to communicate meanings that would be acceptable, really. Uh, now, uh, so the, the whole subject is very subtle, you see. That, uh, uh, we can't throw out the notion of objective reality, but at the same time, we have to notice that it has limited significance. Now, in the sciences, and the hard science, as you call it, it has more significance. But even there, it's limited. When we take this inside, this literal and this participatory inside, that's where we really have to pay attention. Yeah, there, there it's very limited, right? It's literally... The literal things are what sort of give thought that power to do all the crazy things it does. Yeah. Uh, would you say a few words at this point about judgment? Because it always seems to me that this is the place where individual judgment has to come into play. And, um, and I'm confused because of some of the things you said this morning. How wa should one use judgment uh, appropriately according yes, to your right. concept? Yeah, if we can. You see, now, what is, we have to say what is going <coughs> on in judgment. And you see, we make judgments of various levels, like saying this is a table in elementary, judgment based on perception and experience. Or we may go further to more abstract judgments, like this is useful, or going on to judgments of necessity, saying this is necessary and cannot be otherwise, uh, which is a much more powerful judgment, or saying this is true. Right? What I say is true is a judgment, right? Or, and therefore what I'm talking about is real, is another judgment. Now these are the very powerful judgments that affect us, right? Well, saying that we must change the ecological environment. Well, yes, but I, if I say that is true, you see, in other words, if, if that is necessary, the way you put it, must conveys necessity, right? It's saying what is necessary is that we must change the ecological environment. Now that, we made a judgment, we put that forth as a judgment, and we have to say, where does it come from? It might come in various ways. Right? Now, one way it might come by weighing all the factors and perceiving it as well as you can and seeing that this makes sense, right? Uh, by, through perception, right? Another way is that it might come automatically from the program. Hmm? Saying, you know, people get so used to saying it that they just say it, right? Uh, then it would have a different significance then, right? You see, somebody may have noticed what's going on in the world. I mean, it's uh, adding up to danger, right? Uh, the carbon dioxide, the destruction of soil, and, you know, you could go through detail it and you say, this suggests that it's all, uh, the, uh, this is very dangerous, we can see it, and, we ha and if we care about this thing, we had better do something, right? Now that would be something in the nature of an intelligent, through intelligence you make the judgment, right? Intelligent perception, on the other hand, somebody could make the judgment, our nation is in danger, we must uh, prepare for war. You see, we must, we must uh, uh, spend more money for armaments, right? Now, that, that could be of many bases, but one of them could be rather automatic, right? I mean, people have been saying that for ages, and uh, see, one nation says that of the other, and they stir each other up, like the Jews and the Arabs, right? They were making a series of judgments about each other, each one stirring up the other, and going by a program. So, now the judgments that go by programs are very difficult, you see, they cause difficulty. 
because uh, the judgment of what is necessary, what is true, and what is real. These are the three. These are three of the. Or what is good, what is right, you see, and so on. These are the kind of basic judgments which really participate and move us. But who do you make the judgment as to which is a program and which is an intelligent choice? Yeah, well, we can't make it entirely a result of judgment. We, each one of us must look at that and see what makes sense. Now, if we don't agree, we are going to have to have a dialogue. Is what I'm going to suggest. You see, uh, the other person who seriously, who as seriously as you has has uh, uh, presumed to weigh the balance and comes to a diametrically opposed. We are going to have to have a dialogue, and does not want to have a dialogue. Where do you go from there? Well, then, then we don't. But then we're finished. You see, I'm trying to say that. If, if, if then we can't do anything. You see, it may well be that our human race has no solution, you see. That there will be a lot of people who just don't want to talk and each one is convinced he's right and we will just go over the cliff together, right? <laughs> now, I, 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 want, I'm, I say that is not a good, to me, that is not a good uh, uh, tactic or good strategy right? uh, to, to assume that, right? But I say I, I consider the possibility that we can talk and we can finally communicate. And, and share our judgments. Now, uh, the uh, uh, I say that that's the only intelligent approach that I can see. If you think something else is worthwhile, we can discuss it. You see, that's what, that's as far as I'm able to go, right? Historically, it would lead you to believe that we will do this. I don't say we will do it. You see, I'm saying I think we can do it. It's built into us as a possibility. Well, the Pope, I mean, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's quite something. That's quite historical. <laughs> uh, and Gorbachev is saying we're not against religion anymore. It has some good points and so on. He's beginning to, there's a beginning of a mutual, what they call this is negotiation. Uh, you know, it's not an, a non negotiable conflict anymore, right? The losing of the rigidity. Yeah. You, the rigidity started, started losing. Yes, well, and you say, why, why is Gorbachev ready to do that? He sees he's got to do it, or else, uh, you know. What, you know I mean, he can see it won't make sense, and perhaps the Pope sees that too, you see. And, uh, how far they'll get, I don't know, but I'm saying it's a good sign at least. They convert him to become a Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> well, he has converted already to saying, Gorbachev has been converted a long way to saying religion has good points, you see. Isn't he just seeing this because he's saving his own neck? Even if he sees that, it's a very big step, you see. <laughs> you see, uh, because people for ages have failed to see what would save their own neck and have got, have got their necks cut off. <laughs> Isn't that what we're about here, trying to save our own necks? Well, that's one of the things. We would like to go further than that, but if we don't save our necks, we will never get any further. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Come back to that judgment a minute. It seems to me whenever judgment partakes of the feeling of the absolute, we've missed. We're yeah, so it's dangerous there anyway. You see that the judgment of the absolute is the area which is extremely dangerous. Right? So in some sense, whenever I have a judgment, it has to be provisional. Now that's a little bit open. Somewhere there has to be something open, you see, to question. Now, uh, you see, the judgment establishes the question of what is good, what is real, what is true. And it closes, see, once you judge something as real and true, you en engage with it. Until you judge it to be true and real, you're not, right? You say it's merely a representation floating in my mind. Right? I could consider all sorts of things. But when I say that's real, then we're engaged with it, right? Now, that's a judgment. And somewhere in the back of the mind, there must be some little room that's open, so that, say if anything comes in that doesn't fit, you can open it up again, right? Hmm. Now, that has to be in the structure of the judgment. Judgment can't be the largest thing, it has to be just some judgment. Like there's intelligence and goodwill, talk about people who have two different judgments, and how are they going to deal with each other? Well, there's something larger, like goodwill and intelligence and caring. Which yes, has got to be greater than any judgment. Yeah, and also something still greater, which is the readiness to question your judgment. You see, uh, I'll tell you, uh, we'll finish because we must uh, stop. Uh, so we'll make a break. Uh, uh, this will uh, about to, uh, tell you about the two physicists, the leading physicists of this century, Einstein and Bohr, right? And uh, the, um, 
And when they began, Einstein and Bohr were, you know, they were very uh, friendly. And uh, in fact, uh, Einstein writes that he had a feeling of love for Bohr. He thought, you know, it would be great to work together. And they started to talk, you see, and they had two different views, assumptions or judgments about, you know, the nature of truth in physics, you see. <laughs> and um, one about, quant you see, Bohr being based on his view of quantum theory and Einstein on his view of relativity, right? And they talked and talked with the most extreme goodwill, friendship, the very intelligent people, as intelligent as you could hope for. <laughs> and uh, the, um, uh, they talked, but they could never agree, you see. And they repeated their arguments again and again. Right? And gradually they drifted apart after many years and they didn't see each other. And then they both were uh, one year at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. And uh, uh, they never met still and so one mathematician there called Hermann Weil thought they ought to meet and he arranged a party you know where the, they and their students were invited and so Bohr and his students congregated at one end and Einstein <laughs> is at the other because they had nothing to talk about because each one had made a, such a firm judgment as to what is truth there was no room in it for the other person's view at all right no. now therefore it was closed right now therefore even with goodwill and friendship and love and intelligence and all these excellent qualities, uh, the, it still was not enough. Right? Uh, as you have to have the, the realization that judgments have to be open. Assumptions can be, uh, you know, you may are open to question, right? A judgment always contains ultimately an assumption on which it's based, right? There's the, a judgment is based on a premise, you see, uh, one way is the syllogism, the major premise, the minor premise, and the conclusion, right? And the, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, there ha it has to be open that your assumption, that you've got assumptions on what your judgments are based, and that there's room for those assumptions to open up a bit, right? Not to make an absolute conclusion that is all closed together. Uh, now, uh, and this is a very delicate and subtle matter, you see, because once you've made the judgment of truth, then it seems that's it, that's the way it is, right? It's literally the way it is. Closes the door. <clears throat> yeah. If it's that way, it cannot be any other way. So it's absolute necessity, right? If it's absolute necessity, it means your body doesn't want to yield, right? It necessity, don't yield. <laughs> you see, your body takes part in that participatory language, your blood, your bones, your brain, everything, right? The, the, whole, the heart, the lungs, <laughs> they're all in this unyielding stance. <laughs> and uh, now... Uh, so th this is crucial both individually and collectively, and in the dialogue, is the collective aspect that uh, we have got to be able to share our judgments, to, uh, to share our assumptions, right? To listen to each other's assumptions and so on. And uh, in the case of Bohr and Einstein, it didn't lead to violence that they didn't. But in general, if somebody doesn't listen to your basic assumptions, you feel it as an act of violence, right? Mm -hmm. And then you're inclined to be violent yourself. <clears throat> so uh, the uh, 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 so th this is crucial. You see, we need a sensitivity. Well, first we need to understand it intellectually. You see, if intellectually the, the culture says you don't need to, there's no problem here at all, you don't need to do it, you don't even need to think about it, then you'll never get started, you see. So we need intellectually to question that and to suggest something else. It doesn't answer the thing, but if you don't question it intellectually, you are stuck. You see, however unintellectual you may be, you are accepting the assumptions of the culture unconsciously. <laughs> you may say, I only go by feelings, but you're still, see, you may be a strong feeling person, you've made a judgment about religion, and you can't listen to the other religion, right? <laughs> so it doesn't answer anything, right? You see, so you've got to be intellectually clear about what judgments are doing, because judgments are a part of the intellect, and if you're not clear what the intellect is doing, it becomes your master, right? rather than the servant. Hmm? Could you also put it that judgments <coughs> in the normal sense are based on memory, which is the sum total of experience? But they also could be based on perception. You see, if, if they're open, if your attitude to judgments is open, it's always modified by perception. But then that might not be a judgment. Well, we, but still, we call it, a, it would have the form of a judgment, you see, saying, that, you know, this is a table or whatever. You see, whenever you make a statement, there's a vast... Impl implicit uh, 
table, you have to know what a table is. Right? That's right, but you have to be able to see something to know that this is a table and not something else, you see. Uh, you cannot separate it from perception. You see, if somebody says, no, it's not a table, how are we going to settle the issue, right? Yeah. You, you see... He's interpreting, presumably, perception in terms of his experience. That's right, but we have got to first look at saying, what do we see, right? If he's going to argue with you about it, he's got to say, look at this, that doesn't fit a table, right? Now, you may not accept it, or you may accept it, but that would be the way we would have a dialogue, right? So what we're talking about here is the process where the perception, whether it is yours or mine, is interpreted through, through that uh, pot of memory in which are his thoughts and thoughts. Yeah, well, but we've got to do that. You see, the point is we're never going to get out of that altogether. Just to run society, we've got to engage in those judgments, you see. Pointed out not to take them so literally. Yeah. That's right, don't take them so literally, and therefore it's open to perception to say this judgment is not fitting, you see. It's not uh, suitable, it's not, uh, it's, it's incoherent to judge it this way. So whether it's fitting or not, seeing the process which is involving memory, recognition, and experience involved with perception. Yeah, and that, that's the judgment. Now, if the judgment is entirely locked in memory, then it's just what we were talking about. But if it's a bit open, then it goes a little further, right? You know, so that, you see, we are going to have to use judgments in running society and communicating with each other and so on. And we have to have a certain attitude toward them of being a bit open, right? So that we can change them or we can give them up. Or we can make a dialogue about them or so we can see whether we agree. You know, not being like Einstein and Bohr saying these judgments are absolute, right? So, a judgment does not give you truth, that's the important point. What truth is, we'll have to discuss, but a judgment is not the same as truth. But it, may, it has the form as if it were truth, that's where the problem is in our language. You know, a literal thought takes it as truth. Of it. Yeah. Yes, we don't see the process. Maybe next hour, then we should discuss that process a bit more. Mm. The judgment opens the, the way to truth. Yes, it's a part of the process. It is the tendency for creative judgment or for condemning judgment. Yeah, well, our rigid judgment, or say the absolute judgment that closes or a judgment that's more open. Well, perhaps, you know, it's about time to uh, have a break. I think it's about 10, 15 minutes. <laughs>